All right, hello. Welcome back to another Sunday School lesson. And in this, we're looking at John 7 through 10. Uh, this is the uh, Good Shepherd is what this lesson was called. And there's a lot of really good stories. If you haven't read John 7 through 10, a lot of really good stories of Christ in them. So one of the uh, lessons that came out about it um, that was taught in the lesson was that basically if you live by the truths that Jesus taught, you will come to know the truthfulness of them. And it's... Uh, it, it's a very good point. You don't have to know of a surety whether something is true or not to give it a try and see if it's um, if it's uh, the truth or not. And I think that's you know a really I think that's a good lesson for all of us that we need to try you know that especially in terms of um, religion, religious beliefs, and so on. We need to try it and live it before we can really come to a conclusion about whether it's true or not. So, also one of the other lessons that came about was the uh, woman uh, taken in sin, uh, taken in adultery, I should say. Uh, she had uh, apparently been caught in the act of adultery and was taken to be stoned. And uh, as kind of a form of, of a trap, for Christ, they they brought her first of all to Christ and, and said, hey, she's been taken in adultery, what do you think we should do? Type of thing. To see how he'd respond, and Christ didn't initially respond. He, you know, was sitting on the ground and he kept essentially doodling in the dirt with his finger and until finally, uh, after being asked several times, he finally responded, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Now, I, I think it's very important that we note that uh, Christ was, was in no way condoning the act of adultery. Um, he did, in, in fact, actually preach against adultery, against that sort of sexual sin. But uh, he confronted basically all of the uh, accusers with the knowledge of their own guilt. They knew that they had, uh, that they were not perfect, that they had committed sin in their time and as such you know they they couldn't really condemn this person because they themselves would stand in condemnation um i actually just watched a uh movie version of one of my favorite novels uh, murder at the vicarage by agatha christie but there's a part in it where um one of uh, a character in it who is a uh judge it's talking about, you know, you know, being very, you know, militant in in judging people and just, you know, people asking for mercy. And it's like, no, no mercy. And the vicar is just sitting there listening to that. And then he has the vicar. It's like, well, what are you thinking about this? What what do you think? The vicar says, I was just thinking that uh, when I stand before God at the final at the final moment and my only defense for any of my actions were justice, not mercy, it would be a very poor defense. And that's very true for all of us. We are, we have our sins, and so on, but, and we should be very careful when we condemn other people for their sins that we, you know, we're not perfect and we should remember that and perhaps exercise mercy. So, um, the uh, the accusers of this woman basically just left. They they knew they'd been caught out and they left. And Christ arose, looked around, saw no one around except for this woman, and he said said to the woman, "Where are your accusers?" And she said, "Well, they left. You know, there's no there's no one here accusing me." And then Christ said, "In that case, I don't accuse you. But and this is the important bit: go your way and sin no more." And it, as is recorded in the scriptures, and I actually had missed this myself, was that she became a disciple of Christ. She didn't sin anymore. She didn't live that life of sin. She was given a second chance, and she very much took advantage of, of this second chance. Which is, you know, if you're given a second chance, yeah, I think, he, I think this is a great example for all of us. Uh, every time we're, we sin through repentance, we are given a second chance. And 
you know, we should. We should be merciful to towards other people when we can be. And, you know, there are times when we have to make judgments. We'll be in a position where we have to make an assessment, make a judgment. And we should always, you know, be mindful of our responsibility in making the judgment, but also in whatever, in showing mercy and giving people a second chance when we can. Giving the benefit of the doubt. And that can be very difficult to do. It, it, it's easy to, you know insist that we get the benefit of the doubt but not show it to others so I, anyway that's that's what I took from that particular story there but there there's also a really interesting uh, uh, sequence where uh, Christ is arguing with the um, ooh I won't say the uh, Pharisees or not arguing we're having a discussion about Moses and you know and they kind of condemned him and said, well, who are you compared to Moses? And Christ's response was, well, before Moses, before Abraham, oh, sorry, Abraham, not Moses. But he said, before Abraham was, I am. And they immediately tried to kill them. Now, a lot, a lot of people, this has led to a lot of confusion from people. A lot of people don't fully understand the Im implication of what Christ said here. And they don't know why they tried to kill him. Um, it, it's explained in a few chapters later on, but um, when uh, Moses asked for the name of God when he talked to the bush, you know, I, see, I, I confused my Abraham and my Moses there. Uh, he asked, you know, what what is the name of, what is your name? How, how can I say, bring this people a, a nameless God? What, what should I say? And God's response was, tell them I am. And that was his name. And, and as in essence, what Christ did was he identified himself as I am, as Jehovah of the Old Testament. And yeah, that was pretty much, that was a killable offense. That was blasphemy to the point where, yeah, they're going to stone you for that. So yeah, that's why they tried to take his life. And a, little, and a few uh, paragraphs later on, they... Uh, mention that he he had uh referred to himself as god so you know it, it, it's one of those you know little confusions that a lot of people have about this this section but that was why they tried to kill him so let's see so there was there's just so many great stories in this i feel like i'm jumping from story to story but there was um the apostles uh came across a blind man, a man who had been born blind. And they made an assumption that is often made uh, by people even nowadays, which was, well, the man must have been done something to be born blind. Either he did something before he was born or his parents had committed a sin for him to be born blind. And they asked uh, Christ what this man's sin was, what, what who had the sin, the the man before he was born, or uh, the man's parents. And his response was, you know, essentially, no, not all hardships, not all challenges we face in life are because we have sinned. And I think that goes back to, like, the book of Job, one of my favorite books in the uh, Old Testament. You know, and, and that really valuable lesson that Job brings to it that, you know, sometimes bad things happen to us. You know, it's when we have done nothing wrong. And that was the case for this uh, man born blind. Now, there, there is an implication here. So not all uh, Christians believe in a pre-existence. My church, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we do believe in, in a pre-existence. In other words, that we uh, existed before we were born. In this world, we existed as spirits. And... The apostles' question seems to uh, confirm uh, this belief that, you know, they're asking, has the man done something before he was born to be born blind? Um, th there are a few uh, references and so on in, in the Bible and in scriptures that seem to uh, support the point of view of a pre-existence. Jeremiah 1.5 being an example of this. Um, but, yeah. So I think that's... At least, you know, for me, that's an important uh, distinction because it, it does uh, 
support my beliefs, and it does make me think, hey, you know, maybe I was round before I came here. Whoa. And also, you know, the, the biggest lesson, the most important lesson, regardless of what church you are, is that, you know, your challenges aren't because you did something bad, aren't necessarily because you did something bad. Sometimes we are given to challenges. And if you see someone suffering through challenges or through whatever, it's not because of, it's not necessarily going to be because of sin, but because sometimes bad things happen, even to the best of us. So that, that is an important, important thing to remember. And uh, one, one of the other things that's spoken of, it's in uh, John 10, 16. He speaks of other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Now, in uh, the Book of Mormon, in, let's see, 3rd Nephi 15, I want to say 21. Okay, well, here's the reference I have. I don't have them in front of me. 1521 and through 16.5, uh, when Christ is amongst the Nephites, he uh, says that they are the other sheep he has, which are not of this fold. And he also speaks of other sheep beyond the Nephites, beyond the... Um, uh, Jews back in Jerusalem that he went and visited. Uh, now, this actually, this idea that there, are, that Christ isn't just meant for the Jews, isn't just meant, you know, for that one small group of people, but meant for the entire world. That actually, you know, I, I love that idea, and it fills me. You know, it just makes me happy. I, I think it, it's a, it's a very joy, joyful idea that there is more, to, more to. Uh, Christ than, you know, merely a small group of people. He He's the savior of the world. He's not just, you know, the savior of, oh, just those people at Jerusalem or the savior of, you know, the Nephites or the savior of whomever. He's the savior of the world. And I think, you know, that just makes me happy to hear, to think of that and hear about that. And there's one final thing I want to note. It, it's an... Uh, it's not really a part of this lesson. It is a part of this lesson. It connects to the lesson, let's just say that. Um, so, in in this lesson, Christ healed a blind man. He, um, let's see, he uh, spat in, in dirt, made mud, and, and covered the blind man's eyes with mud and told him to go wash off the mud. Now, what... Is, is, is interesting. The reason I bring this up is that I had recently read an article of uh, an actor who shall remain nameless. I can't remember his name. That's the reason why. Um, is apparently playing Christ in an upcoming movie. And he used a great deal of profanity to express that he's not, you know, he, he did not want to do the scene where he, he rubs mud on, on a blind man's eyes, on his eyelids. And tells him to go wash it. Um, and he used a lot of profanity to express his displeasure at that. Because it's like, why would anybody do that? Why would we... You know, it's just... You know, he couldn't understand why uh, Christ would heal a person in this way. You know, putting mud on their eyes and then having them go wash the eyes. And he, he refused to do it in that way. He, he, he actually had them change uh, that part of the miracle in the role he's playing. And... And like I said, he, he used a lot of profanity to uh, express his displeasure. And, you know, because of that, <laughs> I'm basically not ever going to see that movie. <laughs> and, you know, that sounds a little petty. I do actually like to see, you know, movies that show um, spiritual events, spiritual things that happened in the uh, scriptures. And I've seen several about the life of Christ that were just incredible, but... It's it's just the idea that what, what bothers me about it is it, it seems to be so close to what, to how we are just in the world, how the world in general is when it comes to spiritual matters. You know, there's, if we don't understand an aspect of, of these spiritual matters, we basically dis disregard it. We change it. We, you know, throw it out. And we don't realize there might be a very, very good reason 
that certain things were done in a certain way. And so in any way, that's, you know, that just made, just reading this lesson and realizing that that particular miracle was in the uh, scriptures I read made me think of that. And yeah, I just, I just felt it important enough to kind of express my displeasure, my disappointment with, you know, actors, with this particular actor, I should say, not all actors, and just the world in general for changing uh, the spiritual matters of the scriptures. Uh, I, offhand, I can't remember where it is, but it is in uh, the Book of Mormon where it states that uh, mankind will often disregard the great lessons of the scriptures and just you know, we'll think of them as things of not, as if, you know, they don't really matter. And that's often how we, as, as you know, fallible human beings often are. We often disregard it and throw things away. So, anyway, let's pan back, see the... Ooh. Ooh, no. I'll, I'll, I'll do this shot. That's much better. Like that, yeah. So anyway, that's the uh, Sunday School lesson uh, for this week. Uh, like and subscribe. I suggest you uh, read John 7 through 10, and uh, let me know what you think. Uh, bye.